Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Let's cue the intro. This is the number one podcast to learn marketing strategies for your board game. Whether you're just starting on your first game or an experienced designer, you've come to the right place. My name is Nalin, and let's talk marketing for your game. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Board Game Marketing Podcast. In this podcast, I interview creators who have successfully funded their ideas on Kickstarter to learn more about their journey to launch and help you formulate your own plan. I also bring on experts in the tabletop space to talk about all the facets of marketing and building your game publishing company. If you've been listening for a while now, you know that I hold nothing back. So in these episodes, be prepared to hear me ask the hard questions and really get down to the finer details. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Today, we're super lucky to have Gabe Lawson on the show, and I'm so excited for everything that he's going to be sharing with us today. So Gabe, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, first, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about this project and, you know, before we go to, into the nitty gritty details here. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the game I created is called The Escape Box. Uh, it's something that I've had uh, the idea for for a couple of years, actually. I just didn't really have the time to kind of devote to it until the last few months. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it's like an escape room in a box. Um, so you unpack the box. Uh, there's a theme that goes with each game, and then you solve a series of puzzles. Uh, that are integrated into the storyline. So it basically, uh, you're basically like a character inside of a movie or inside of an escape room. So there's kind of like an end uh, objective. And uh, so you work to, together either alone or as a team to achieve that objective. And, uh, and you either win or lose based on what happens at the end of the game. So there's uh, the first three titles that we put out are, one is called The Pirate's Code, which is uh, like a pirate's theme. Another one is called The Bank Heist. And... Uh, the last one is called Lost in Space, which is um, basically you're on a spaceship which ha- uh, is about to hit an asteroid. Love it. I love this like kind of puzzly um, kind of adventure in a box that you've created pretty much um, from for this, right? The, the typical audience isn't a lot like, you know, typical board games, I would say. I'd love to understand more about how you kind of figured out who your audience was and how you, you know, started communicating with them for the pre-launch. Yeah, for sure. So actually, um, I my background is uh, is in owning escape rooms. So I opened my first escape room about five years ago in Montreal, and then um, kind of proceeded to open a few more from there. And then um, actually, luckily, prior to COVID, we had actually sold our facilities because we moved into being a supplier for commercial escape rooms. So we were uh, kind of traveling around building escape rooms um, all over the world, mostly in North America. And um, so when COVID hit, obviously, that business kind of died down. Uh, all the escape rooms in the world are kind of on pause. They're in kind of a state of flux waiting to see what happens with COVID. So anyways, um, so yeah, as soon as that happened, I I kind of transitioned full time into working on this. Um, My audience, I mean, eventually I'd like it to be kind of the general public, but to start off with, um, we're mostly focusing on people that are kind of in the escape room space or in the puzzle space. Um, Especially since the start of COVID, there's been a a whole surge of new uh, kind of puzzle games that have come out. Um, so the space is filling up really fast. I think like, you know, a year ago, there were only a handful of kind of escape room type games you could play at home. Um, I mean, there's a big difference between your average puzzle game like Sudoku or something like that and and, and more of an escape room kind of, uh, we like to call them narrative puzzle adventures because they kind of blend puzzles with a storyline. Um, so my audience is really people that are kind of enthusiastic about narrative puzzle adventures, but I think that you know, eventually we'd like to move more into the open market just because I think that a lot of people would like the games. They just haven't necessarily been exposed to a game like that before. Um, So yeah, I mean, we didn't do a whole lot for pre-launch, to be honest. Like we actually didn't even put up a website or a landing page. There's a lot of the kind of roadmap to success Kickstarter um, kind of strategies that you probably should do. I I didn't really do. And uh, I guess in hindsight, I, I probably should have, but I also kind of figured that the product would probably sell itself once people kind of understood what it was um and then since this is just kind of our first iteration i figured well i'll put out my first few games out there and then see what the response is like and then you know if we're going to do another kickstarter in six months or a year or something like that then um then 
certainly I'll focus more on kind of building an audience beforehand. But um, so yeah, I mean, really the only thing we did ahead of time was put up an Instagram page. Um, it's kind of the only thing we did before launch day. Got it. Well, I love these like alternative um, paths to success pretty much. So I'd love to kind of dive in some more about this, right? You said you had an Instagram come up. Uh, what were you doing on Instagram? How are you kind of fostering community? How are you kind of reaching out to these people who you've identified as, you know, people in the kind of escape room niche? How are you kind of doing that? Um, yeah, so basically what we started doing on our Instagram is just posting um, some of our concepts for the games. So we came up with 12 games. The idea is that eventually we would move into a subscription model, so we'd have one game per month. So my strategy was to come up with 12 different themes, but I knew that producing 12 different titles right off the bat would be uh, just totally mind-boggling of a task. So we picked three to start with, um, and then we left the rest of the games as stretch goals. But uh, So basically on Instagram, we just kind of posted um kind of a teaser for each game kind of um making people wonder what the game is about and then as the weeks went on we kind of um put a little bit more detail into the posts um there's a couple of facebook groups that i was a part of um which have to do with puzzles and so i think that's probably where a good amount of our initial backers came from um just kind of people finding out about it on there i made a few posts on there just prior to launch and uh just after launch just letting people know that it was available um but yeah, I mean, we, I, I, to be honest, we didn't really take like a super structured marketing approach. I kind of just put it out there, saw what the response was, and then kind of um, built off that. I guess for me, I'm kind of lucky because coming from a commercial escape room kind of background, I have a lot of experience in, in terms of like what people like and, and don't like for puzzle games. And so I had a little bit of an advantage going into it because I kind of knew what people would respond to. Um, and then obviously you know, with everyone stuck at home, it's perfect time to, to have a game like this because they can't go to escape rooms. Um, I mean, so, some of the escape rooms in the States are still open, but I think by and large, they're mostly restricted. And so people are looking for things they can do at home, either alone or with a couple friends or family members. So I kind of structured it. Um, the game is, is for one to six players and you can definitely play alone, but I think it's best played with a smaller intimate group, say two to four people. Um, particularly like families or couples or a group of friends. Um, so I structured the puzzles and the gameplay to kind of fit with those number of people, um, just because, uh, you know, in a typical escape room, you might have a lot of puzzles that, that require multiple people, but I didn't want uh, the game to be limited to two or more people. So I designed it in such a way that you can play with one. To, um, and I think that helped in being widely appealing because I think a lot of our uh, backers are going to end up playing alone and then a lot of them are going to end up playing you know with two or three or four people so um i think that was an important aspect to the game is having it uh having a wide range of players that can play in terms of a uh, number of people um yeah i sorry i got kind of set sidetracked there i don't know i don't remember exactly what the question was <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no worries. No, I, I I just wanted to go back to what you were saying earlier too, because you mentioned that you have this background in escape rooms already. So you kind of knew going into this what people would respond really well to. And it was kind of like doing market research already from what you were doing before, before you even came to this, you know, game world. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I've been definitely lucky. Like I've played hundreds and hundreds of escape rooms all over North America. So I've you know, I have a really good understanding of what's out there. And um yeah, like when COVID hit, a lot of people, a lot of escape room owners tried to transition to online games and stuff like that. But for me, I kind of prefer a more analog experience. I find a lot of times games that involve the internet or Googling, they can get kind of tedious and they're a little bit open-ended. You don't really know what the boundaries are. So I wanted to have something that you can just open the box and play right away. You don't necessarily have to mess around with um, an internet connection or, or Googling stuff. Um, I didn't want like there to be any prior knowledge required. So it's the type of game where you can just open it up and play right away. Um, but yeah, for me, I mean, Kickstarter was brand new. I've never run a campaign before. Um, so really what I did is I just looked at some of the successful, um, kind of puzzle campaigns that have been out there in the past and saw what they did and, um, tried to, uh, tried to replicate some of their strategies. Um, I think by and large, most of the successful puzzle Kickstarters have definitely built up quite a following and they've sent their games out for reviews and things like that. But um, since we were kind of in the prototype stage, they're not, they weren't totally ready to be play tested um, prior to launch. So I figured, let's just put it out there with a sort of an attainable goal. Um, so not something super crazy high. And to be honest, my, 
the, the costs associated with the project, you know, were higher than my initial goal, but I figured it was better to set something realistic because, you know, coming from a commercial escape room background, I don't necessarily have, you know, um, kind of like a famous name in the consumer space. And so nobody knows who I am in the kind of at home puzzle, um, puzzle space. And so I wanted to put something out there that was kind of realistic, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a big learning journey since day one. I, I had no Kickstarter experience whatsoever. And so I think now I have a pretty good understanding of how it works and what kind of things are involved. But I mean, I'm just at the same time, I'm kind of still beginning my journey. So I think there is a ton more. I'm sure it's going to be another year of learning before I feel like I kind of comprehend the the situation. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that you were looking at other kind of escape uh, room games or other like kind of puzzle box games too on Kickstarter. Can, would you mind kind of walking through some of the strategies that you found from them and what you kind of took away for your own campaign? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, <clears throat> actually, for any game, you know, personally, I prefer to see games that are not kind of um, renderings or prototypes that look unfinished. I want to see something that looks tangible, because oftentimes, um, in the puzzle space, especially in real escape rooms, you'll see this really amazing marketing image. And then when you play the game, it's like, kind of lackluster. And so one of the things that I really prefer as a, as a consumer is seeing uh, the real product, not just a rendering, not just kind of a, an, a, an imagination of what it could be like. And so because my games were still in the prototype phase, we kind of had to do both. So we, we took as many real photos and videos as we could of the prototypes. Um, but then, you know, for the other nine games, we had to use kind of renderings of roughly what they're going to be like. But um, yeah, in terms of what I learned, <clears throat> I had a few good games that I could reference. Um, so there was kind of, I would say, uh, like four or five games out there that I that I kind of took note of. So uh, some of those are like Key Enigma, which is a company based out of Spain. They um, ran a Kickstarter earlier this year, and it's a pretty similar concept to mine. A uh, couple differences is that their games are a bit longer and they're kind of more um, internet heavy. Um, so that's one of the references I took. And um, another one is the Emerald Flame which is uh, by Post Curious and Rita Orlov based in New York. And uh, she ran a really wildly successful campaign. They raised something like 300 grand um, also earlier this year. And uh, I think she had uh, released a couple games before, so she had quite a big following going into it. But uh, I think both of those companies really executed their projects well. I mean, they made regular updates. Um, I think, uh, you know, delivering on time is something that's really important. I think that, you know, especially in the puzzle forums, I see all the time, you know, uh, companies, oh, we're delayed six months, we're delayed a year. And this is really frustrating for backers. So I wanted to come up with a timeline that, you know, didn't make people wait forever, but something um, realistic that we could deliver on. So I think we put it about four months after the completion of the campaign is when we would be shipping out, um, which I, I felt was kind of reasonable. Um, so yeah, I mean, some of the things I learned from those campaigns are like just showing as much of the actual game as you can. Um, they also put out sample puzzles, which I really appreciated because, um, you know, creators make all sorts of puzzles and they're not necessarily everyone's taste. And so they put out some cool sample puzzles. Um, I think for me, uh, you know, it was a decision where like the problem that I had with sample puzzles is that the puzzles in the escape box are quite integrated to the story. So in order to understand them, you have to have a lot of pretext and a lot of context going into it. So it's not something where you can just jump in and solve a puzzle in five minutes. It's something that you're gonna spend an, at least an hour working on. And so one puzzle might lead to the next or be embedded in another one. So I didn't really wanna just put out there a couple kind of like Instagram formatted puzzles because they wouldn't really reflect what the product um, would be like at the end of the day. And actually, overly simple sample puzzles have actually dissuaded me from backing games in the past. And so I actually didn't really release that many sample puzzles. Instead, um, we tried to engage with our community by um, creating a mini game. And so we actually put a vote on our Instagram. Uh, so we said, hey guys, uh, you know, we would like you to come up with some ideas for a theme and then we would like you to vote. And so um, we had it, you know, like on Friday, um, everyone suggested different themes over the weekend. And then on Sunday night, which everyone had the most votes, uh, we started working on to make a real mini game out of. And um, so uh, the winner in our case was Alice. Uh, it's actually called This Isn't uh, Wonderland, Alice. And it's kind of a grim, uh, a little bit uh, 
dark take on Alice in Wonderland. And so we actually started right away the next morning. As soon as that was decided, we started working on it, kind of structuring that mini game. And then we were able to release some of the content. And so I knew that we wouldn't be able to finish the mini game before the campaign ended, but we would at least be able to show people what it would be like. And I think that helped a lot because you can tell, you know, especially with graphic design, you can tell if someone put five minutes into something or five hours. And um, it's something where for a mini game, it's going to be a couple hundred hours of work total by the time it's done. So I think people were able to see kind of the quality we were striving for and get a sense for what our objectives were in that case. Um, I guess another thing I learned is that shipping can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, a lot of these campaigns had really, really complicated um, shipping tables. And so I wanted to put together kind of a simple matrix just showing how much it was uh, to each country and then just try and make it as realistic as possible. Um, I think shipping can also be a bit of a deal breaker for people, especially with boxed games. You know, if they're spending, you know, 50 bucks on a game, they don't want to spend 50 bucks on shipping. And so I did subsidize our shipping a little bit, but um, I also decreased some of the shipping prices halfway through the campaign once we had hit a certain capacity. So for example, once we sold X number of games in Australia, um, then it, it's going to allow me to ship a pallet of games there and then kind of uh, use a fulfillment company to ship from within the country. And so that allowed me to kind of actually decrease the, the shipping cost halfway through the campaign. And then I think that allowed a lot of Australian backers to come on board um, who were maybe a little bit price sensitive to the shipping beforehand. So, yeah, I mean, shipping is definitely one of the things I learned. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, just like overall presentation, trying to have some FAQs uh, ready ahead of time, trying to anticipate what people are going to ask so you don't get, um, you know, hit with a million questions on day one. So I tried to answer a lot of questions in advance on the campaign page, but then also in the FAQ page. Um, so yeah, I think those are my key takeaways. And then, um, yeah, so Emerald Flame, Key Enigma, those were some pretty good inspirations. There was also a couple other ones which were not necessarily uh, overly successful Kickstarters, but uh, they're definitely ambitious projects. So one of those was uh, the Wilson Wolf Affair, which is a uh, kind of a, a fancier version of my game. It's a several hundred dollar game. And so um, the components are maybe a little bit more uh, voluminous. And um, so that was a really ambitious project that I was able to learn a, a little bit actually what not to do, because I think that um, they had a couple um, kind of uh, issues in their campaign, you know, with delivering late and having damaged pieces and whatnot. So kind of tried to take some notes for, for what not to do there, but um, a wildly ambitious campaign that one was. And um, yeah, let's see what else. I mean, there's been a few other kind of puzzle box um, Kickstarters out there. And I think a lot of them um, did so well because they were able to send it to a, you know, a few kind of um, influences, influencers or bloggers ahead of time. I mean, I don't know if, if you've heard of Chris Ramsey, but He's uh, kind of a, becoming a go-to puzzle guy on YouTube. He's got a few million subscribers and a lot of companies are kind of trying to go through him to uh, promote their product or get him to time his review uh, release on YouTube with, uh, with their product launch. And that seems to be working pretty well, but um, it's, uh, you know, he's a busy guy. So I didn't, I didn't reach out to him to try and get him to do one because I can just see how wildly overwhelmed he is. And I figured let's wait till our product is totally done. And then he can just try a production copy anyways, rather than a prototype. But um, yeah, I mean, and then actually during our campaign, there was a couple others that launched right before or right at the same time. One of those was um, Mother of Frankenstein, which is uh, based on the author Mary Shelley, the creator of Frankenstein that's uh, done by Hatch Escapes out of uh, Los Angeles. They did a really beautiful campaign. Um, I think they did pretty much everything right. You know, they sent uh, prototypes to reviewers in advance. They did, uh, you know, a really beautiful campaign page, really beautiful video. Um, so, you know, that was nice to follow along. And then actually on the same day as ours, uh, another really inspiring company out of Hawaii called uh, Society of Curiosities launched and they launched a little game called um, The Fairy Tale Files, which is like an envelope based uh, puzzle game as well. And um, they're notoriously good at social media. So I was able to kind of see what they were doing and keeping their audience engaged. And they, they did a 10 times better job than I did on social media, but at least it was something to strive for because they're making, you know, five, six posts a day and stories and all this kind of stuff. And I, uh, I'm not a huge social media guy myself. So we kind of just did, you know, post every couple of days and tried to engage with some other creators and engage with some of our audience on Instagram, kind of seeing what they're up to. Um, but uh, yeah, they were definitely something to strive for. So 
I'd say I learned a little bit from all of those companies, just in little different ways. Yeah, there's, there's, it's, we get a lot of learnings that you're just kind of going through there. One of the things that really stood out to me was kind of that balance that you have to strike between, you know, having a game that's in prototype phase, like you're, you know, or like in late stage prototype, you know, getting ready to be a really beautiful, complete game and having one that's a lot more complete and having all those beautiful graphics and getting all that ready for Kickstarter. How did you balance that? Um, when you were doing the pre-launch and what types of content other than those like mini games that you were doing, what were you able to offer for your audience? Um, I mean, well, so one of the things we did was um, the, the nine stretch goal games that we had were just basically proposed to people as a title. So for example, um, one of them was called the time machine, but aside from that and aside from the outside of the box, people didn't really know much about it. So what we did is um, once it was unlocked, we would make it available as an add-on and um, uh, tell people more about the game. So show them a few few pieces from inside of it and talk to them a little bit about it in some of our updates and then um, kind of add the storyline onto our page. And so people were kind of, I think, motivated to learn more about each game as they went. And I think that definitely spurred some action in terms of pledging for multiple games. Um, the vast majority of our backers actually pledged for multiple games. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, if you were making, I would, you know, a standard board game in the board game space, I think it would be really hard to run a Kickstarter without having a full working prototype. So I think we're lucky in that sense because the kind of mystery puzzle adventure lends itself to being a little bit mysterious. And so I think we're able to sell people on an idea without necessarily having a fully fleshed out 100% produced game. Um, but if I was to produce, you know, any other standard board game, I think it would be really challenging to sell people on an idea. I think that we're just a little bit lucky being in the puzzle space, we can get away with that. But it's, I don't think I would attempt the same strategy if I had a, a regular board game of any kind, just because looking at, you know, being on Kickstarter and seeing how many games are out there, it's actually, it's mind boggling. There are so many board games popping up every single day. And I've seen how difficult it is for creators to get traction. And I've seen um, you know, how much work they put into it. And it's crazy. And I think it's just because there's so much content out there and it's really hard to come up with original ideas. And even if you do, then you have to tackle the whole, uh, you know, logistics and production of actually making a game, which is, you know, very time consuming. Um, in our case, you know, coming from a commercial uh, escape room background, I already kind of knew how to set up production and knew how to hire the right people. So I think that we were able to scale up our production and our content creation department a lot faster than if I was more of like a mom and pop uh, kind of if this was more of a side hustle but I actually made it kind of my full-time focus and so I think that helped too I think if I had tried to tackle this while having a full-time job it would be really really difficult um, yeah yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the, the people who are listening here actually uh, do you know the whole full-time job thing and then balance creating a game too and I always find that so commendable because it's just I can't even imagine the amount of effort it takes to bring this to life while holding another another job too yeah exactly I mean especially if you have kids and other kind of things um you know that take up your time I think it would be incredibly challenging I guess in our case I've kind of made a big bet on this game um in the sense that it's not something I want to run a Kickstarter for and then just kind of give people the games and let it be it's something that I'd actually like to build a real company out of and you know, um, like hit, you know, seven figures in sales is kind of our goal within a year. Um, I think we can do that just because um, we tried to come up with a price point that is reasonable, something that's going to leave a little bit of margin, you know, enough margin for retailers at the end of the day, something that's sized um, affordably, uh, you know, something that can be shipped affordably. And then my biggest focus actually was on creating tangible gameplay pieces, because I find with board games, they can have, you know, really beautiful artwork. But at the end of the day, it's mostly paper or, um, I mean, in the board game space, you know, mo mostly meeple or mostly uh, little characters and things like that. And, and it, with puzzle games, it tends to be mostly paper. So you're dealing almost almost exclusively with paper, which uh, as a medium, you can be very creative with, but there's a ceiling, there's kind of a limit what you can do with paper. I mean, once you've made your 1500 variants of puzzles on paper, you kind of run out. And so that's why I knew that I wanted to make a product that had a lot of physical pieces. So um, you know, finding a balance of uh, cost of production versus like tangible gameplay has actually been the hardest part of it. But I wanted something that was really tactile so people could unpack it and, um, you know, 
feel the actual items in their hands, get a sense for the environment that, that the game is taking them to, and then interact with those objects. Because I think you know one of the differences in the puzzle space versus the board game space is that the objects they're interacting with in our games are integral to the storyline and they're actually integral to solving the puzzles. And so it's not just a, something pretty to look at, it's something that you actually have to really analyze and figure out how it fits into the story, figure out when to use it, and figure out what it, what it even is in some cases. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, I think running a Kickstarter with a full-time job or with kids uh, would be super challenging. So I, I'm glad that we that we took it um, took it on full time. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, so far it's going it's going really well. We just wrapped up our campaign. Um, we're about to launch our pre-orders, and we've actually had a lot of interest from retailers, which has been great because I'd really like to see this in a retail environment. Um, obviously, right now most sales are being done online, but if things resume back to normal in a year or two, then I think um, this will be a great product to have in retail just because there's not really anything like it. Any of the puzzle games out there right now are mostly card-based, um, mostly paper-based. There's very few games which have tactile elements to them. And I think that's just because game producers have, uh, you know, they want to keep as, as large margins as possible. And it's really hard to produce physical items at a, at a really low price. Um, so I think we're sacrificing a bit of margin just to get our just to get the games out there. So we're not going to make you know a tremendous amount of money on the first iterations, but at, at least the quality will be high enough where people will play it and then want to to buy more. And then it's kind of a long term strategy. So um, yeah, I, I'm gl definitely glad that I'm doing it full time because there's just no way I'd be able to handle it if I was in school or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, and you know you mentioned a few times now that you're you know a first time creator to Kickstarter, first time kind of um, launcher on Kickstarter. What was kind of the most surprising things about the platform or like what was kind of the some learnings that you had about the platform itself for other new game designers, new designers coming to the platform? Um, I, well, I mean, there's a few things. One is if you're trying to get a hold of support, don't expect a fast answer. That's one thing. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, definitely set up your, your launch page ahead of time. Um, if you can get your preview page live, uh, I was lucky ours got approved right away, so I didn't have to wait, but, um, I'm good friends with a few other people who are working on projects and, you know, they're hitting, um, hitting the, the launch or not the launch button, but they're, um, they're putting their preview page live a couple days before and, you know, it's not getting approved right away. And so they're having to delay their projects. So I think definitely putting your preview page live as soon as you can, or I mean, at least a couple weeks, um, you know, before your launch date is super crucial. Um, yeah, Kickstarter, I think, has, I'm actually surprised that they don't have more competition. I think it's just because the name is so good, but I think there's a lot of ways in which they could improve, but I think just because they have so much support, I'm not really sure what it is, but um, definitely there's, like, you know, I'm not sure why they don't improve in these areas, but I think there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, like, the fee structure is very fair. I think that um, what surprised me I guess was um, it actually, I think they did bring a lot of backers to our campaign. I think a lot of people found it in the advanced discovery, um, like looking at our links and where the customers came from. I think um, I might've brought around half of the, of the backers, I would say, but I think Kickstarter probably brought the other half in one way or another. I mean, it's hard to say exactly, but I think that's um, something that most people, I don't think most people should rely on Kickstarter bringing a whole lot of backers to you. I think you really have to go out there and do the work yourself. Um, just because, you know, like when I went to browse for our game, I would go in different browsers and see if it was coming up and like, you know, it's it's nowhere near the top top ranking in any category. It's way buried in there. So I have no idea how people found it whilst on the platform. But I did try to fill our page with as many keywords as possible. So like puzzles and escape rooms and all all those kind of keywords and Maybe that helped, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I would say um, in terms of surprises, um, I mean, nothing really other than just, you know, it's time consuming. That was that was surprising how time consuming it can be. You know, you know, you might not get a message for four or five days and then all of a sudden you'll get 20 messages and it's like, you know, even if those only take five or 10 minutes to, to handle each time, that's a good chunk of your day gone just in messages and then you have comments and you have emails. So. It's, I think the surprising thing would probably be just how time consuming it is just to maintain the uh, maintain the project, especially if you're also doing content creation. Because in my case, I'm I'm the game designer. So, um, you know, we're trying to pump out content, but then I'm also handling the 
kind of the public social side of it. And that's very, very time consuming. So um, yeah, I would say the biggest surprise is just that it was a little bit more time consuming than I thought it might be. Got it. And I once was wondering too, like throughout the campaign, right? The one year, one year live, what kind of things were you doing to kind of get the word out? I know you talked about having those mini games to get people, um, you know, playing along to understand more of the type of quality that you guys will offer in the actual real campaign itself, the product. Um, what else were you kind of doing to get, you know, the word out there? Um, I mean, you know, to be honest, like I was probably one of those guys spamming all the Facebook groups with my Kickstarter link, which you probably shouldn't do, but I figured, Hey, uh, you know, it's my, it's my opportunity to do that. And, uh, I tried to support as many creators out there as I can, as I could. Um, but I mean, you know, not a whole lot, to be honest, aside from making Facebook posts on Facebook groups, um, we didn't really do any paid advertising. So, um, not a whole lot. I didn't really do that much. I, you know, I tried to keep our Instagram audience engaged um, by posting regularly there and then just letting them know how much time is left in the campaign and stuff like that and trying to let them know, hey, if you have questions, let me know. Like I want to I want to help you understand what the product is if you're not sure because it's definitely not a simple game. Um, there's definitely a lot of people that, um, you know, I, it's actually one of the reasons I picked that name. I actually don't love the name The Escape Box. I think it's kind of a silly name, but it's straight to the point for what it is. And, and so I figured, you know, one day when it's on a store shelf, if somebody sees the escape box, it's going to be pretty clear to them um, what it is, but I actually don't think it's the best uh, name out there, but I want, well, I know I took a compromise there, but um, yeah, I don't know. We didn't do a whole lot to be honest. Like I, you know, I, the, the one thing I tried to do is get back to backers as fast as possible. So if someone's asking me a question, I tried to respond to them, even if it's, you know, 2 AM here, tried to get back to them as soon as I could. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, mostly just posting on some Facebook groups. I mean, um, you know, we dropped a few links on some, some, uh, other Kickstarter related sites like KickTrack and things like that, but I don't think that that really generated anything. I think it was mostly just the Facebook groups and, um, Kickstarter bringing us backers and then maybe a little bit from our Instagram. Although I did put a custom link on our Instagram and I don't think we had that many people, but you know, I mean, it's hard to gauge someone might click your link, but then not buy it. And then they might come through another browser another day. So I think tracking metrics are a little bit um, imprecise uh, with unpaid advertising. So yeah, I mean, not a whole lot. I think maybe if, maybe we could have done more for sure. Um, but uh, yeah. Got it. And what's next for, for you now um, with this game? I know you wanted to scale to seven figures. Like what are kind of your marketing plans to, to get to that from now? Yeah. So actually right now we're working on our um, pre-order page. So I, I, we anticipate based on kind of backer feedback, we, we anticipate that there's a lot of um, current backers who would like to buy additional games because we didn't unlock all of our stretch goals. And there was a lot of people that wanted to wait um, until the pledge manager stage to add additional games, just because I guess it was, it's, um, you know, it's laborious to go back and change your pledge three or four times each time a new goal is unlocked. And I totally get that. Actually, the reason I did that was because I didn't want to, you know, put the game out there and then have it be a huge failure and raise like five grand or something, and then be committed to creating 12 games, because that would just be financially terrible. So, um, I don't think, yeah, I actually don't think it was a good strategy to make stretch goals. Um, that were not because you know typically I think with stretch goals you want to have something that benefits everybody it benefits all the backers or at least some of them and in this case it doesn't really directly benefit anybody it kind of just unlocks more games and makes more content available which did work but I don't think it's necessarily the best strategy um, but um, yeah I guess in terms of how we're moving forward so so right now we're putting together a pre-order page trying to make that as seamless as possible I think that as a backer myself, I've seen a lot of survey processes and pledge, man pledge management um, processes that just take forever and they really try upsell you as much as possible. And like, certainly we're gonna make, um, you know, our games available for our backers, but I also wanna make it kind of a painless process. I don't want them to have to take half an hour going through our survey just because it's not, I don't think it's fair to them because I've been through so many surveys where it's like, just takes forever. You have to have three different logins and it's just like really arduous. Um, so, you know, I, th I think people will appreciate that because we'll, they'll see that, hey, we're not just trying to sell them. We're not just trying to get as much money as we can from them. We're just trying to have, let them have a good experience with us. Um, so, yeah, so we're putting together our surveys and our pre-order uh, page right now. And then um, one of the main things we're focusing on is trying to come up with um, retailer strategies. So we're going to make some of our own uh, customized display cases. So not a display case, but basically like a stand-up 
um, like cardboard display. And uh, I, the reason we, we did that is because I know having retailed games myself in the past is that you often don't have uh, space on your shelves, especially in like really clustered um, board game stores. So if we can offer them a free display where they can actually put our products on, on a standalone display on an end cap or something like that, then I think that's pretty appealing. And, and based on the feedback we've had so far from retailers, um, that's been a good strategy because you know they don't necessarily have the space for it. And especially, I think with this product um, in a retail environment, it's gonna do best if we can kind of show what's inside of it. And so by making our own displays, we're gonna be able to tell people more about the game without them having to pick it up and take it apart. Um, and the retail side's been going really well. I think you know in the next month, we'll probably sell a lot. I mean, we are selling a lot more um, retail packages than, than our Kickstarter, than the amount we raised on Kickstarter. Um, so our retail side will end up being pretty big. And, um, and then, yeah, just putting together a pre-order page, because there's a lot of people that have messaged me since the conclusion of the campaign, just being like, hey, I didn't find out about this in time. Can I still order? And so I think if we put together a nice pre-order page, then that will drive sales. And then my strategy actually is to just kind of lay low a little bit on marketing and not push too hard until um, the games are out there in February. That's when the first ones are released. And because I know that once they're out there, people will be receptive to them. You know, I mean, you're never going to please everybody, but as long as I please 80 or 90% of our customers um, and they're happy to buy more games, then the rest of the model will kind of play out naturally because we have nine more games coming after that. So if they, you know, if they like the first three, then they'll probably go and order uh, some or all of the other nine right away. So that's kind of my strategy because I knew that if I just made one game, you know, I'm limited to that one game. And uh, for me personally, I don't, I don't really want to play like an eight or 12 hour game just because it's too, it just takes too long. You have to break it up over multiple days. So I wanted something that you can, you can hammer out in a session. It's going to be a long night, but you can do it. And um, that way, you know, people feel satisfied. They've completed the game. They're happy with the price they paid. And then hopefully they want to go buy another one. And I think that's the strategy that will carry us going forward. Um, because the only way we can make more money is by selling more games. So um, that's kind of the strategy is to, yeah, focus on a unique retail approach, having some custom displays and then working with the retailers. I'm, I'm actually even going to pay for um, putting their logo on some of the displays uh, for the retailers that, that would like that. And then eventually I think we'll reach out to escape room owners to retail it um, in their stores or online as well. But I want to make sure that we fulfill our Kickstarter rewards too, because another thing I've seen happen is companies will run a Kickstarter and then they'll just start selling on their website and shipping right away. And that's just terrible because then all of their Kickstarter backers are, are waiting for a product and now they're seeing it, um, you know, cheaper online. Actually like case in point is there was a company uh, called Magic Puzzles recently. They did like a $3 million Kickstarter and then um, they actually shipped to Target before delivering on their backer rewards. And so as far as I understand it, they're doing like hundreds of thousands of dollars of refunds because uh, backers are upset because they, they paid more than it costs at Target and they still haven't received their products, but they're retailing them at Target. And so I, I want to make sure we don't do anything like that. So the first people to get the games will be the first people to backed. And then from there, we'll focus on, uh, on sales. So yeah, I don't really have... I'm not really going to spend a huge amount of time in marketing over the next few months just because I want those backers to feel like they got what they should have from the Kickstarter process, which in my opinion is getting first access to the games. If, if, you're, if you're supporting a brand new project, you should be the first one to get the games, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're kind of going to lay low for the next few months and just keep everybody happy, get the games, and then as soon as the games are out there, We'll make definitely make a marketing push because at that time too, it's going to be something that we can send to reviewers and something that they can post about. And then we'll have a lot more to talk about too, because, um, you know, being, being puzzles, it's like, it's difficult to talk about because we can talk about, um, you know, what kind of puzzles they are. We can talk about the theme and the story, but we can't really like reveal too, too much to give it away. And at the same time, like it's, um, you know, every puzzle is totally different. So it, it's kind of a, it's difficult for us to talk about. So we, I'd, I'd rather just show people and rather just get it out there. And then I think the word of mouth will kind of grow itself a little bit once it's out there and then we'll, we'll feed off that. So yeah, that's our strategy. I love it. I love that you started off, you know, this endeavor 
uh, before Kickstarter, thinking really long term about what you want to be doing with the product too, rather than just being like, hey, this is a cool, fun idea. Um, let's put it up and just see where it goes. You know, there's a really kind of solid plan and outlook ahead, like, you know, a year, two years down the line, even you're talking about, you know, having these maybe selling in these escape rooms once we're, you know, coming out of our homes again, which I think it's incredible. And a lot of people kind of lose sight of that big picture when they are just looking at the Kickstarter as kind of the end all be all for their entire process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, I knew that like, you know, to make the quality of games I wanted, it would, it would, it's going to cost a lot of money. It has cost a lot of money already and it's going to continue to cost money just because, you know, we're producing in Canada and the States and, you know, um, we're paying a living wage to the people that are working here and it's, you know, it's not cheap. So, um, you know, I knew that it was going to be a big financial risk. So I knew that it's not, it's not something that's going to pay itself off in a month or in three months. It's going to take a little bit longer before we see a return. And I, I'm fine with that because, um, you know, I know that in six months time, I'll have products out there and, you know, hopefully I'll be very proud of those products and that they'll kind of, um, the, the quality of them will, will spur people to buy more. But um, yeah, I mean, it's something I'd like to do for, for a while, definitely a couple of years at least. Um, I mean, in a perfect world, I would actually like to sell, sell the concepts or sell the games to a bigger company um, down the road. Like actually the very first escape room in a box was called the werewolf experiment. Um, and that was made by a couple ladies in the States uh, who have a company now called the Wild Optimists. And I'm not exactly sure the terms of their deal, but as far as I understand, they sold the concept to Mattel. And I think from a production standpoint, it makes a lot more sense for a really big company like that to be producing the games just because they can, they obviously have a lot more economies of scale and they have a lot more distribution channels. Um, so I'm going to have to, I think eventually find a compromise of maybe getting the cost down a little bit, but maintaining the quality. But yeah, I think eventually the end goal is to sell it to a bigger company that can handle, you know, cause we're not going to be able to put together the distribution that Mattel, for example, would have, you know, that would take, you know, decades. So um, eventually we'd like to sell it to a company. And so I'm kind of making decisions now that will allow us to do that just in case the opportunity comes along. I mean, it, it might never come along, you know, or, you know, maybe no one will like the games. I don't know, but um at least we have that kind of uh, foresight so that if in a year's time, uh, you know, a big game company really likes it and they would like to buy it from us, then at least we have kind of some, some exit strategies and some, um, some roadmaps lined up for them so that it's not a huge, uh, like not a super difficult thing for them to acquire it. Um, but uh, on the same token, if, you know, if we're producing them here locally for, for a long time, I'd be happy with that too. Um, so I think we have a few, kind of options but um yeah I mean I like I've designed so many escape rooms and so it's like you know my I one thing I found was my reach was really limited like I would design one in one city but nobody outside that city would have ever heard of it and if you're not building in like a top tier location in New York or LA chances are no one will ever really find out about it except people in that town so it's really a, your um all of the work you're doing is really isolated and that's why I was really excited about this because I know that every hour I spend on the product, it's really, really scalable. I can, I can people anywhere in the world can play it. We can translate it to different languages. And um, so my, my time spent is a lot more scalable than, um, you know, my, my previous work where it was limited to that region. And so that's actually really motivating because I know that the time I put in is going to be um, exponentially appreciated eventually. Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense when you're kind of expanding your, you know, your own possibilities um, with, with just the time factor of a product rather than just um, designing the escape room in a certain geo too. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show and just sharing all these insights about the campaign and also about kind of this long-term kind of business vision look um, from a Kickstarter launch too. I know that a lot of people will really, really appreciate this kind of long-term look that you're, you're bringing to the table uh, from the launch of this game. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's uh, nice to get to think about all the things we've done and all the things we're going to do. So maybe we can recap in a year and see where we're at. Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to find out more about the project, kind of follow along, get a copy themselves, where can they find you? Yeah, for sure. So right now our website is theescapebox.ca and uh, you can find our old Kickstarter page um, by searching for The Escape Box. But uh, if you go to our website, we'll have a link on there that'll link to a pre-order page sometime in the next few days and that'll be 
uh, live up until February, and then we'll transition to a to an online store at theescapebox.ca. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. And that wraps up our episode today. If you found what we talked about today helpful in any way, please be sure to leave a review to help others find this podcast. And most importantly, if you're feeling that fire and you're ready to get started on your Kickstarter campaign, be sure to head to the show notes of the podcast. I've linked some of my resources that others have used to successfully launch and get funded. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Board Game Marketing Podcast. For daily tips and advice, find us in the Board Game Marketing Group on Facebook. See you next week.